Welcome to the Parsons Communication Design Lecture Series. My name is Pascal Glissman. I'm full-time faculty and an associate professor of communication design here at Parsons. And we already had an exciting series of in-person lectures this spring. Today, we're meeting on Zoom because we are traveling to Lisbon to meet Silvio, which I'm extremely excited about. Hi, Silvio. I'm going to introduce you in a moment. But before that, I want to point out that the CD lecture series allows our students to meet design thinkers and practitioners within the discipline and adjacent field. We have one more lecture coming up, and this will be the final lecture for the semester. We will meet Elizabeth Goodspeed on Thursday, April 26th in Kaplan Hall. So we're going to be back in person. As always, you can learn more about the upcoming lecture from the Communication Design app, and you can watch all the past lectures on our YouTube channel. And again, one more time, please keep yourself muted. And with that, hi, Silvio. I'm so excited to welcome you to our lecture series today. Um, Silvio is a writer, artist, and designer based in Lisbon, Portugal. He published Andrew Precariat in 2018 and What Design Can't Do in 2023. Silvio is an assistant professor and co-director of the Center of Other Worlds at the Lusophonia University in Lisbon and a tutor at the Information Design Department of Design Academy Eindhoven. He holds a PhD in Design Sciences from the Luaf University of Venice. Um, Silvio, I saw that your publication, What Design Can't Do, is basically a collection of essays on design and disillusion, and it's introduced with the sentence, design is broken. And then it says, young and not so young designers are becoming increasingly aware of that. So I think that is a really exciting way to start this. And I hand this over to you, Silvio. Welcome to this. The floor is yours. I, I don't need to uh, say much uh, about myself, thanks to uh, Pascal's uh, nice introduction. So I, I'm going to directly jump in to um, to these pictures that shows like my two my two books my my two dear books, um, and uh, 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 you know in a, in a certain way they are like complementary, um, and they show a bit like my 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 interest and um, and my let's say research obsession. Uh, the first is called Entre Precariat and was like more or less about labor and precarity and entrepreneurialism. While this new book on uh, is more specific about design culture, uh, and I would say focus more on the notion of uh, of the professional, what is what it means to be a professional today. I also like to call them, let's say, the Marvel book and the uh, the DC books. And today I'm going to focus more on the Iron Man, so the the the, the Marvel one. Uh, just just a few bits of info on this book. It was published by Set Margins. Um, which is a Dutch uh, uh, Dutch publisher, and uh, the design is by Federico Antonini, which is like a very good friend of mine. And you can see like these tiny bits of uh, the Melancholia by Dürer in uh, in in the cover and back cover, which is something maybe not obvious. Was like we were so immersed that uh, we thought it was like was extremely obvious, but then we realized that many people didn't get it. So I'm happy to say it. Uh, uh, because I didn't want to be esoteric with this. So um, what is the, uh, the book about? Um, let's say, to, to, to summarize it in a sort of one-liner, uh, what I did in this book was like to collect and uh, analyze what I would define uh, vernacular, informal, colloquial expression of disillusionment with design, and use them a bit as a lens to look at the multiple and recurring crises of, uh, uh, of the field, which in themselves, in themselves, they uh, somehow mirror like a more general crisis of uh, modern subjectivity and modernity at large. Um, so some of the categories uh, deployed that I deploy in order to, to describe uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this crisis uh, are, uh, have to do with the, the dichotomy between order and chaos. Uh, and I start the book with this definition by Victor Papanek, which probably 
most most of you uh, most of you know. Uh, so the definition, as you can see, is strongly um, uh, hooked on a notion of order. So uh, design, according to Papanek, is the conscious and intuitive effort to impose meaningful order. Uh, but we know, like, if you think of the metaphor of uh, uh, of, of like you know the the kids room like a parent entering a kids room you know that the the precondition of uh, of order is not really void no it's not really a blank uh, uh, slate but really chaos um, and uh, let's say the tactical move of writing this book was like to speak about design not from the perspective of uh, how order is constituted, but really like from the location of chaos. And when I say chaos, I mean it in the most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, like wordly terrain, um, like hardly, uh, uh, with the most like basic meaning, like uh, the, 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 the manual chaos of like everyday life. Uh, the the dust, you know, like the the, the books that are what well, what you see in my background, basically. Well, it's it's quite okay. It was it was worse in the uh, in, in in different times. But like this idea of like uh, um, the entropy that surrounds someone, like, like the the subjects' lives. Um, and the, the, with the like, I wanted to focus with this sensation that uh, uh, you know chaos is a sort of active. Uh, uh, agent in itself is something that seeps in that uh, you know we are constantly uh, uh, fighting against uh, and I think like a good uh, good um, um, summary uh, good iconic summary of the book is this uh, is this meme it exists in various versions um, and uh, basically um, let's say the design discourse, the design tradition has always been focused uh, uh, on the top part. So on the idea of the utopian politics, on uh, uh, how uh, uh, things like uh, con concentrated with, uh, uh, how to put it, with um, uh, the, the things that ought, ought, ought to be better, not to use the definition of uh, Herbert Simon. This uh, leads to a sort of abstraction, which is intrinsic to, uh, to design thinking, not the idea of the project, of something projected into the future. Uh, but then, as soon as you start to connect this uh, abstract, distant dimension, this utopian dimension, to the uh, petty uh, reality of everyday life, that very image of the utopian politics acquires, uh, of the utopian images, acquire a, a completely different, uh, uh, different meaning. So basically the book is located, locates itself in the kitchen sink, in the bottom part. And um, it uh, presents itself as a sort of theory of the kitchen sink. What, what is to, what, how do we see uh, the utopian politics with all the, uh, you know, the flamboyant statement once we go back home and we have to wash the dishes. Uh, so this is somehow uh, the, 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 the strategic location of the book. And this is just like a summary of, um, of like, let's say, the mood, the vibe, the, the attitude of the book. But today in particular, I want to focus on a notion that um, uh, I tackle into one of the essays of the book, because the, uh, the book is basically a collection of essays, also quite different, quite, quite diverse uh, in themselves. Uh, and it's the notion of uh, criticality that uh, I'm sure that um, has been present uh, uh, in also in, in your institution as a, uh, as a value. Now it's become like value in for, for design culture. So when I speak of criticality, I don't mean just critical design. And I will explain uh, uh, like more in detail uh, what I mean with this kind of uh, value that has become uh, really, really, um, uh, really adhesion to many design practices. Um, so, but before entering into the, the, the specific, and our specific understanding of uh, criticality, I think it's uh, uh, a simple uh, distinction is due between like what we, what we would call critical thinking and what we consider critical theory. 
um, so in a very crude uh, uh, slide, uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would describe the two in this way. Uh, so, so looking at the, at the left, I would think of uh, Descartes or the Enlightenment, etc. So the idea that critical thinking is about seeking truth through uh, the exercise of reason. So it's a dubitative uh, position uh, that, uh, uh, that has like reason as a form of, as a high form of uh, experience in the world, understanding the world. Critical theory is a bit different. Uh, in the sense that uh, um, understands, uh, and it, it doesn't throw reason out, but understands the world uh, in terms of uh, power structures. What, what you see on the right is like Horkheimer. Um, and the interesting aspect here is that to a certain extent, while critical theory can be considered a continuation of critical thinking. It's not a coincidence that Horkheimer and Adorno in Minima Moralia, they say uh, that uh, the Enlightenment is still our project. But uh, in uh, following reason all along, you start to criticize uh, reason itself as being the result of, uh, of, uh, of uh, power structure, manifestation of the very power structure, of, the, of, of those very power structures. Now, uh, while I had to, uh, why do, did I have to um, open this uh, small parenthesis? Because I think that uh, um, there is like a bit of a risk in education to go to entering uh, and uh, in design discussions to enter uh, directly the critical theory lens uh, before having exercised critical thinking. Uh, so the risk is that, um, you know, um, any, any manifestation of, of the world or any phenomenon uh, is read um, mostly and uh, mainly through, through the category of power. Um, and this has some, uh, uh, some, some dangers also in developing what we would call like more basic idea of critical thinking. So the, to put it this in a more dubitative way, to what extent um, uh, like a lens on power prevents um, a sort of um, a more, 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 uh, more like, let's say, um, open approach to, uh, to, 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 uh, to relating to, 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 to society and to the, to the world out there. Uh, so to what extent critical theory becomes um, itself a sort of um, uh, opaque base? Uh, but um, so now that, that I made this uh, clarification, I hope I made this clarification. Um, the question I, I want to ask is like, what role does criticality uh, play in, uh, uh, let's say, social positioning? And uh, um, my, my reference for this uh, is the work of a um, US scholar called Nicholas Holm. Um, basically, the idea proposed by Nicholas Holm is that uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the tool of, uh, of the elite, uh, the, the tool that the, the elites use to distinct themselves from the common people, from the masses, which was, uh, according to Bourdieu and others, like the aesthetic judgment. You know, the elites were able to read, not, not only to spot what is high culture and low culture, but also to read the words in aesthetic terms, while the working classes didn't have that luxury. So in order to, um, you know, to, to position yourself uh, upwardly, uh, you would develop that aesthetic judgment. Um, according to Nicholas Holm, things have, uh, have changed. Um, and uh, uh, what has substituted the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic disposition of the elites is something that he calls critical disposition, which is basically a popularized form of, uh, of uh, critical theory. Uh, you can read it uh, here. It's like very, very close to the Horkheimer idea of like uh, questioning power structure. So the critical disposition, this is Holm, encounters texts. And when I say texts, of course, I, uh, he, he means it in, uh, uh, in, in a broad semiotic uh, sense. Um, 
So tax in terms of their politics, their entanglement in wider structures of power. So uh, the, the point that derives through this is that the, the distinction between like the elites um, and the common people is not anymore in the type of artifacts. It's not anymore in the fact that uh, um, um, uh, like the elite would listen to uh, uh, to Beethoven while um, I don't know the the the, 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 the lay uh, the, the lay person would listen to a pop song, but in the way any cultural artifact, high and low, traditionally high and low, would be interpreted. Uh, to to zoom in very quickly and briefly into um, uh, our uh, design world, like graphic design world. Um, uh, this meme somehow, even if it's a bit like maybe a bit extreme in this sense, shows uh, some of the aspects uh, of, of the critical disposition. Because what it displays here is the fact uh, that um, in many contexts, um, in, in, in certain contexts, like the same artifact is not, um, uh, is, is not evaluated for uh, uh, like it's uh, it's aesthetic dimension, it's um, um, uh, uh, aesthetic structure, let's say, but there is like um, an intentionality that has to do with its politics in terms of presentation and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and intention. So basically, um, the same artifact when it's presented according to political teams acquires a different value. And there is also a, um, a side effect, a corollary effect, in which um, speaking formalistically about, uh, uh, in, 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 traditionally, uh, in traditional aesthetic terms, uh, about uh, an artifact, about a text, again, uh, in, in Nicholas uh, Holm terms, uh, is casted, can be casted as naive. Um, you can see it in the meme, it's like, it's spoken through as just formalist uh, experimentation. It's, it's in that just that you see the uh, value judgment. While the, the, two, um, the two readings of an artifact, the two interpretation, the two presentation of the artifacts are both uh, valuable and legit. Um, so the, the, the example that um, Nicholas Holm makes are Hollywood blockbuster. Um, so um, the latest Hollywood blockbuster is, for example, criticized for its reproduction of regressive gender politics or celebration of the market. This was written in, in, in 2020. Uh, a few years before, like what's uh, what's what is become very obvious in our uh, cultural landscape. Just think of uh, Barbie or Poor Things. Um, so, uh, what is very important to point out here to avoid uh, misunderstanding is uh, that Nicholas Holm is not, and of course, me following his argument, um, are not diminishing any like the criticality. Are, uh, we are just interested in uh, um, showing and understanding how uh, that critical disposition plays a sort of professional role and how it somehow su substituted that. Also, uh, by tendency, personally, I'm way more uh, attracted by the, the critical theory and critical disposition. Uh, but that um, uh, doesn't diminish, uh, let's say, its, uh, uh, its positional values, so to speak. I'm going to tell you uh, just very briefly, uh, like a personal anecdote regarding the uh, the, the, the the first uh, Dune, uh, the, the the Dune one. After watching it together with friends, I remember like you know the uh, beer after you talked about the, the movie, um, and um, um, uh, it's like I was somehow. Um, speaking about like the, the qualities of the movie, what I liked. And what I liked was um, very much in formalist terms. I like the architecture, the scale, the fact that, uh, um, uh, you know, like the human presence is very small compared like to these big forces, which is even more clear in the second part. Uh, but then like the counter argument in this, uh, you know, 
cafe discussion was like how yes but how couldn't you notice um how um let's say how orientalist uh, uh, it was like the representation of uh, of the fremen for who watched the, the movie um and uh, as soon as th this statement is done um, any reflection on the, you know, again, like on aesthetic uh, values is casted uh, as, as naive. There is no, um, like, you can easily spot in common conversation that uh, nowadays uh, this, uh, the, the, the critical reading has more value, uh, is a stronger currency in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, let's say, in social debate, in social media debate, in cultural interpretation, and so forth. Um, oh, this, why is this here? This, this is exactly, the, ah, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, when we relate this uh, to design, um, we, we have to ask, uh, like, a, a sort of side question emerges, and it's like, but, is design about aesthetics? Uh, was, if now, um, let's say, a critical disposition is uh, uh, a gaining, gaining traction, was it, was it, uh, uh, is it real that in the past uh, design was acting through the classic, uh, the traditional, the, the uh, let's say, the Beaux-Arts uh, aesthetic disposition? Um, I would argue that yes, it, it, it was. It's simply uh, that the, the aesthetic of design culture had a particular name, which was function. Um, from the Bauhaus on, uh, we can argue together with the um, theorists like uh, the, the German uh, Wolf, Wolfgang Fritz Aug that what design calls function um, is uh, some sort of appearance of uh, use value. It's like a, a, a sort of self uh, self advertisement or what uh, it consider it, uh, itself function. Because of course, functionality we, we know it very well is a very relative and subjective uh, feature of the object. Uh, but design culture, one of the triumphs of design culture from the Bauhaus on, was somehow. Uh, to clarify, to, 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 to pretend to a certain extent, to uh, be able to split the functionality to the ornament, to the excess, etc. And here, my main reference to say this is Jean Baudrillard, uh, who understands like design culture and Bauhaus as a sort of, um, um, as akin to, um, uh, to a general equivalent, to something that creates a feature that allows to, um, to compare objects that are completely different, a bit like money. Um, OK. Um, now, uh, how uh, does um, this critical disposition spe uh, specifically manifest in contemporary design culture? Um, I, prob I, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but at least in Europe, the notion of um, uh, raising awareness has been very present in uh, um, the, 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 the vocabulary of design culture. So to prove this, uh, there is like this nice, um, uh, this nice uh, collage of description of uh, projects at uh, uh, Design Academia in Doven by Af Afonso de Matos, um, in which he shows that this formula of raising awareness is constantly is is um, over overused. Maybe like is is used a lot. So where does this come from? Um, I mean, here I have to say something um, um, uh, maybe a bit uh, harsh about like let's say the design essence, design soul. So um, it's I, I think it's uh, it's a truth that the, uh, design, especially information design, graphic design, has always had 
an aspiration to be pedagogical, to educate its user, to explain things. Um, to a certain extent, even to be, um, uh, it, it can even be considered paternalistic, uh, condescending. Uh, a simple uh, example of this is what happened during, the, during the, the peak of the pandemics, where designers started to uh, design posters explaining how to wash your hands. So it's a lot in line with this idea of like, we have to elevate the people, we have to elevate the working classes. In fact, and this is like something I don't say in the book, but quite frankly, I believe that the, if you would ask what is the class, uh, the class position of design as culture, I would say is the bourgeoisie. It's like that kind of um, um, is the idea of uh, having uh, uh, you know, the value set and be able to spread them to, uh, uh, to, to all the rest of the people. It's always from the top to a certain extent, this design culture. Traditionally, of course, there are like the exception, but they just confirm like a sort of general rule. Um, so um, while this idea of raising awareness on one side is attached somehow to, um, let's say, design, uh, like the vocation of, of design as a whole, it's interesting to see how um, it connects to a more like general, uh, let's say, uh, positional gains uh, that happen within like uh, the, 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 the scope of liberalism, so to speak. Um, and I think this was well described in the most concise way by a um, U.S. artist called Brett Roman, whose activity um, is mainly to write, uh, 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 to create video reports. Um, here, what he was analyzing was like the kind of discussion on social media. Um, but I think it can be extended to you know, like debate uh, at large. Uh, the argument that uh, Brett Roman was doing is that raising awareness uh, has like a side function, an hidden function, which is not just to make people aware, but to make people aware that you are aware, are you, that you yourself are aware of like the important conversation. It's a way to enter like um, a sort of space of debate and uh, uh, to demonstrate your own, let's say, up-to-dateness, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I think like the raising awareness in design is a lot about this because very often um, it feels like uh, the, the, the project that are supposed to raise awareness of the, of the people uh, construct these people in order to show that they are aware. Now, uh, for example, there is like um, uh, a lot of uh, projects about, uh, and here I'm like speaking conversationally about this, um, about like uh, how um, uh, social media use, uh, you know, like use data for profiling. Uh, and uh, still like this uh, uh, for, for uh, user profiling no? and still like it feels like that this that people uh, like have no idea that this is happening while there are like Netflix uh, series like speaking about that. So it seems that sometimes you construct this, this uh, image of um, uh, of a uh, of a. Uh, uh, of, of users of like the people that are um, um, they, they lack the knowledge in order to portray, uh, project uh, the sense that you as designer have that, that knowledge. And also the point is that the people doesn't exist anymore, no? So there is no, no general idea of the public. Uh, and design very often speaks in terms of things in itself, uh, uh, things in terms of a uh, general public. Um, how, uh, if, if the goal, if the practice, uh, the activity is that of uh, raising awareness, or at least like the goal, the vision, uh, how does this manifest concretely, materially? Um, I think it, it happens with, um, with an interesting reversal, which I, I, I called, I started to call ornamental politics. Um, so 
if it's true, as Brett Roman says, as Nicholas Holmes says, that, uh, you know, uh, politicality, like to uh, display a political, um, uh, a political interpretation of, uh, of social phenomenon is a plus, is something that uh, um, gives us um, somehow more value as players in a positional game in society. Um, and uh, when I say game, I don't say in a cynical way. I say it because uh, really there is, uh, you, you can read um, 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 uh, exchanges uh, and practices as a form of, uh, uh, of a field. Um, and this is like uh, my reference to it, of, for this is like, again, like Pierre Bourdieu. The idea that uh, uh, it's uh, uh, like the cultural practice are convertible in, in forms of capital, symbolic, uh, economic, etc. But um, if this is all true, if there is like an incentive, implicit or explicit, uh, to manifest the critical disposition, um, then um, sometimes you would have the incentive to um, somehow decorate projects uh, that are, could be formalistic with, uh, um, with, with, the political, uh, with the political allure. So we have an interesting reversal of, uh, uh, of the so-called aestheticization of politics of uh, uh, Walter Benjamin. So the idea that um, is the uh, politics itself that becomes form is the politics itself that uh, becomes a form of decoration. And it's not that designer add decoration to political content, it's vice versa. Uh, now, it might seem a, a very abstract what I'm saying, but uh, so, so I added a, a few examples that uh, I think captures this very, very clearly. Uh, there is a form, a, cult a very uh, recognizable cultural form of this which uh, is what I call in the book the faux picket, like the, the fake picket, basically, uh, in which you have like the aesthetics of, of the protest of uh, activist ideal politics with slogans that are not actually attached to, to uh, actual cause. So this is like, for, for example, was in Berlin in 2017, uh, where you have like the, the protest imagination uh, and then you have like slogan just like je suis raclette which is uh, uh, but um, in the very context of uh, of the netherlands now for example the dutch design week you had this uh, uh, the idea of the picket as a sort of uh, uh, spectacular performance that again like sheds light sheds light on the on the aspiration of design culture Final example uh, in, this, uh, in, in this line of uh, uh, ornamental politics is this incredible movie by Max Lenz, which is a German director. Uh, it, it, the movie is a sort of bleak look on, uh, uh, on, on the, uh, let's say, the intermingling between academia, uh, politics, and innovation. And in this, what you see in this scene is like a professor who uh, looks at the, a protest of the students. The protest, as you can see, is very stylized. It's a bit, it shows a bit like the aesthetic of the movie. But the interesting aspect is that the, the professor reads the, uh, the protest uh, through uh, the, with, with an aesthetic lens, with an aesthetic disposition. In, in fact, he says, like, very interesting, uh, very interesting and creative disposition. Protest. So it, as if it was like a, pa a painting to contemplate. And by doing this, he reveals uh, somehow the, the decorational quality uh, of it. Um, now, this is like the most difficult part, which are, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's at risk of, uh, of, uh, of misunderstanding. So I, I really hope to say the things I want to say without... Uh, uh, with, with, without, um, uh, let's say, giving excess of interpretation of what I say. So I'm going to uh, take extra effort uh, in, in, in this part. Uh, so if all the discussion about uh, the, the critical disposition 
of course involves like the subject um and so the question is like what what uh, what what role does identity play uh, when it comes to manifesting the critical disposition and uh, we have to to do a, a, a sort of a jump in the past and uh, start from this consideration that um, in white collar jobs uh, which design to a certain extent is one of them um, somehow the, the the skills that really matter are not anymore neither like strength nor actual intelligence but really personality takes like a centrality that never had before uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in history uh, and uh, i think to, to prove this is very simple uh, in, just consider like the emphasis on uh, soft skills uh, in uh, uh, you know in uh, on LinkedIn, so to speak. And uh, you know sometimes someone has the sensation that so soft skill is a managerial term for personality. Of course, I'm stretching a bit here, uh, but you get the sense of of this argument. Um, so the shift uh, I, I, I somehow um, highlight, which I think has both positive and risky um, 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 consequences, is this. Um, in the past, like the, the profession would somehow be uh, like the basis of identity for um, uh, for for like the 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 the, the, the liberal professional the, the nice example like the simple example to capture to capture this uh, is the doctor now in my hometown small hometown you would call a person not even by name they would identify so fully with the, their profession that you would call them the doctor the architect now nowadays we have like a sort of shift in which um, the, the identity itself acquires a professional, uh, like it is somehow professionalized. Um, and this um, uh, happened in the in design, in the field of design, through, uh, is, can be, let, let's say, looked at, it can be like highlighted from the tool, like this cultural form, which is the professional bio. Um, so, professional bio in certain spheres of design has become, uh, for better or for worse, interestingly or not, this I leave it to you, uh, a space uh, where like people can manifest proud pride and a sort of sense of affinity. Um, it can be a space of uh, protest, can be a space of um, uh, of 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 um, uh, of like fighting a certain exclusion, and these are like some examples of professional bios that manifest to a certain extent like uh, uh, the, the 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 professionalization of identity. Uh, for example, it, 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 it's um, um, to a certain extent is something that never has uh, been seen before that uh, you could uh, um, add to a, a professional bio, um, something that you would strategically essentialize in order to um, uh, bring on like a political agenda or uh, as a form of emancipation. So to call yourself in your professional bio on LinkedIn, on your website, queer designer, liberatory designer, or um, identify as a mother. So um, I don't uh, uh, I don't spend too many words on the uh, let's say emancipatory aspect of this because I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, it means that finally one can uh, bring to the fore something that uh, in the past would limit their professional possibility. Uh, so it's a form of uh, of pride of. Uh, political action, um, but at the same time, there are like some um, uh, uh, some risks that shouldn't be ignored, in my opinion. I'm going to try to describe them um, through some examples. For example, a Documenta 15 in Castle, like the last Documenta, highly criticized by the way for for various reasons. Um, you would find a bit of the sense of like how identity 
understood uh, in this kind of professionalization um, process can, can become uh, a sort of a negative feature, like a trap. Uh, in the sense that, for example, uh, like a group of artists would write a statement like this. My biography seems more interesting than my art. Um, in which there is a sort of expectation from the outside that the biographical should, should emerge. Um, so the, 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 the risk, uh, briefly put, is that um, uh, the uh, identity aspect of a work uh, becomes a necessity of someone practice that is forced upon, that identity is forced upon on someone. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I found this manifesto that somehow seemed to, uh, to, 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 um, to, to express this, uh, uh, this risk, in which E. Jane uh, says, I'm not an identity artist just because uh, I'm a black artist with multiple cells. So uh, they are somehow rejecting this, um, this, uh, uh, this essential idea of identity pushed on them. Another interesting example, again from Documenta, um, is uh, from um, a Palestinian artist who um, speaks of like the, the political value of doing non-political art. Basically, his argument is the following. Uh, for, us, um, uh, for us coming from, uh, um, let's say, politically charged areas, uh, it, seems un it seems impossible to do formalist art. And again, we go back to the aesthetic disposition because like, the, the general expectation is that, that everything we do is, uh, has, is and must be uh, politicized. Therefore, about like, like the powers uh, that, uh, uh, that oppress us and so on and so forth. Uh, and those are like um, um, some examples on the wild. More personally, I've noticed five minutes, perfect. Uh, yeah, uh, I've noticed in uh, in uh, uh, several educational contexts, in a sort of um, um, uh, in a sort of implicit uh, uh, way, like uh, an expectation, a reinforcement of uh, 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 of, uh, um, of like a sort of nudging of uh, bringing to the fore um, like your biography understood as uh, one uh, like one uh, like one essential essentialized let's be let's be more precise essentialized feature of identity um, so this is like the the risk and the trap uh, I, I I see uh, five minutes so um, okay I'm gonna speed up on this so um, all of these um, uh, features, uh, all of these um, 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 ideas about raising awareness, etc., to me can be summarized within like this notion, uh, which is a bit cheeky, but comes from. It's also an homage to um, an Italian cultural creative, which is called Tommaso Labranca, which spoke of critica oke, emphasizing the repetition aspect. Um, and basically, the argument I want to do here is that uh, uh, all this uh, raising awareness, manifesting critical disposition happens to a specific use of language. Um, if um, uh, Mladen Silinovic could say back in the days, like uh, a few decades ago, that an artist who cannot speak English is no artist, he feels that nowadays, um, an artist or a designer who can speak a specific kind of English, which is what um, Alex Rule and David Levine defined international art English, um, couldn't be artists or designers. No? So there is, again, like an incentive of using um, a certain um, uh, language that uh, charges artifacts with, with a certain political intentionality. Uh, terms like interrogate, subvert, uh, imbricate, displaced, 
that um, makes sense within this larger logic of the critical disposition. It's not a coincidence that, uh, I think, that in a critique of critical design, which I didn't speak much today, like the specific current of critical design, therefore like speculation, etc., uh, the critique is, is similar, it's about language. All the projects articulate, refuse critiques, but transgress, formulate, etc. Um, so, just to summarize, these are like the list of, uh, of the so-called uh, critical, okay, so critical disposition, ornamental uh, politics, or politics used as ornament, uh, the paternalistic ambition to raise awareness, uh, the risk and the opportunities of uh, using uh, of uh, using identity as a professional uh, uh, skill and uh, you the uses and abuses of uh, of uh, of international art in english two more words to conclude uh, it's, it won't be um uh, you know full fledged um, um um uh conclusion but i think like a couple of words like to uh, zoom out from the uh, from from the book and to um, uh, from from this chapter and to speak the book at large are um, somehow necessary. Uh, so I open the book with this uh, uh, with this quote by Antonio Gramsci. He says, "The challenge of modernity is to live without illusion and without becoming disillusioned." Um, what I've tried today uh, and in the chapter in the various chapter of the book is like really to uh, you know tear apart a bit of certain illusions. So one of them is really like this idea, this paternalistic ambition of educating, of like raising the awareness. Uh, because I believe that it's exactly in the maintaining, um, in the keeping of illusion that disillusion, disillusionment uh, emerges. Uh, and uh, another quote that I'm really um, close to, I, I feel an affinity to, is by an Italian fiction writer who speaks about literature, but I think that the same can be said about design. Uh, the design criticism really changes things when it bumps up against its own powerlessness. Um, so uh, my effort in the book and uh, let's say in, in my design criticism has always been like to tackle uh, the spaces of lack of power, of like not being able to do. And from this, um, uh, this is where the, the title of the book derives. Thanks so much.